Um, as we are in Switzerland, we start on time. Uh, I'm Marco Sassoli, director of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, European Society of International Law lecture uh, on disruptive military technologies by Professor Robin Geis, our new Swiss IHL Chair at the Geneva Academy. I see a lot of familiar faces, but you have to stand that I uh, explain you in two minutes, uh, because I see also some other faces, fortunately, because otherwise it would be the usual suspect. What the Geneva Academy is, it's a joint center of the University of Geneva and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. Uh, engaged in uh, transfer of knowledge on the one hand uh, uh, with three masters, one on international humanitarian law and human rights, one on transitional justice and an executive master uh, uh, for professionals in Geneva on international law applicable to armed conflicts and then we are engaged in research projects mainly policy research in both humanitarian law and human rights and we are a kind of platform uh, in our headquarters at the, at the Villa Moignier, where we meet, uh, uh, where diplomats, academics, civil servants, uh, human rights militants meet uh, in a more informal setting to discuss the contemporary problems of international humanitarian law and human rights law. And this is a little formalized, at least for the human rights part, by the Geneva Human Rights uh, Platform, which is in particular concerned about the reform of the human rights mechanisms in Geneva. Uh, welcome to Robin Geis for his first official um, a lecture in uh, our uh, new uh, Swiss IHL chair of the Academy. He started on the 1st of January and uh, he will, in the Geneva Academy, both in teaching and research, focus on the subjects uh, he will speak about today, uh, weapons, uh, new technologies, new means and methods of warfare, artificial intelligence, uh, cyber. Uh, the position of a Swiss uh, IHL chair has been offered by the Swiss Department of Foreign Affairs to support our outreach in the field of humanitarian law. It's interesting that in Geneva it's more difficult to finance humanitarian law than human rights law, which is good uh, news for human rights, obviously, and therefore we are happy about that. Uh, Robin Geis is Professor of International Law and Security at the University of Glasgow and they are Director of the Center uh, for International Law and uh, security. Uh, he is also a visiting professor at uh, Sciences Po in Paris and uh, he is uh, a member of the German National Committee on International Humanitarian Law. Previously he had taught in Germany and before even that he was in Geneva. Uh, he was legal advisor of the International Committee of the Red Cross. He has published a lot on humanitarian law and human rights in recent years, focusing on uh, aspects of new means and methods of warfare. So uh, we are fortunate to have a real specialist uh, on uh, the subject he will speak about. Oh. A very warm welcome. Thank you mm. to have accepted and to have accepted to deliver this uh, European Society of International Law lecture. Disruptive military technologies, well, I would say uh, every military technology is disruptive. Huh? Here, nevertheless, I see a lot of international lawyers and uh, international law. Military technologies disrupt what would be the normal situation, which is peace. Um, 
The question for lawyers is obviously whether the existing law can adequately cover those technologies and the traditional answer by a civil law trained person like me is obviously yes, because uh, the law does not only apply to the situations the leg legislator has foreseen, but also to, to all future situations which fall under the wording in conformity with the, ob with the object and purpose. And I'm happy that I'm not the only one who thinks so, because the International Court of Justice, as many of you know, in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion has said, that the existing rules apply to all weapons and methods of the past, of the present, and of the future. But this is not the end of the story, and therefore I'm very much looking forward to your lecture, because um, it may be that there are some technologies, and in my view there are some technologies, where the existing rules are simply not adequate, and uh, which fall in the gaps or the cracks of the existing law, and Professor Geis will try to uh, identify those. So, thank you so much, welcome, and thank you to all of you to have come, joined us. So, uh, thank you, Marco, thank you very much <clears throat> for your kind works, uh, words. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm honored and delighted to be here today, and certainly honored and delighted to be at the Geneva Academy now. And having lived uh, in Geneva for a number of years, uh, it's certainly great uh, to be back here today. Now, we're filming this event, and I understand I have to be quite static, which is not my usual way of speaking, but I'll <laughs> try to <laughs> remain within the frame of what we're filming. So, disruptive military technology is a bit of an obvious pick, of course, but then we're seeing significant and rapid, accelerated technological innovation across a wide range uh, of fields currently. And I think these innovations, they are adding new layers of uncertainties uh, in, in an already volatile global security environment. They're challenging some of our entrenched paradigms on which we've built the 20th century global order. And they coincide and interlink with a range of other transformative trends, the return of geopolitics, global power struggles, a widespread backlash against multilateralism and the rules-based international order, uh, and they're challenging in profound ways, uh, also along the new emerging line, uh, ideological divide between liberal democracy and authoritarianism. And I think within this very dynamic and volatile environment, the uncertainties that are added by new technological capabilities are significant and challenge the legal order in different ways. I think, uh, I mean, as the incoming chair, Swiss chair on IHL, sticking to convention and the job description, I guess, I have to focus myself really on IHL here today. But of course, we're seeing challenges uh, across the board of international law also, and especially on the level of use at Bellum, with technologies that have facilitated increasingly disruptive intrusions in a time that's a gray zone, it's between war and peace, and I think that's also an area uh, where we're seeing profound security challenges that we need uh, to be uh, aware of. Now, which technologies are we really talking about today? Uh, there is a range, but at the end of the day, I'll only really focus on two. There is outer space. You will have seen that NATO only a few months ago at the last summit in London, they decided uh, to now declare outer space the fifth domain of warfare. You will have seen Donald Trump uh, tweeting about the space force in the United States that's being set up. So outer space certainly is on a geopolitical scale uh, an, an important, very important issue. Two manuals in the making currently to figure out which laws would apply to outer space. But from my perspective, I wouldn't consider this particularly disruptive. There are certain outer space specific challenges. But I'm not aware that this outer space and the militarization of outer space is, is really ch deeply challenging the legal order as we know it. Yes, there is a debris issue if, if you kinetically destroy satellites in outer space. That's an environmental issue first and foremost, a humanitarian issue if it happens in wartime, certainly. Uh, there is a dual use issue around satellites, but these are issues we can somehow handle with the toolbox that we know. There's other technological developments. Hypersonic missiles is deeply troubling because it offsets power balances. 
It creates a prompt global strike capability and Russia is claiming to already have it. Um, that's certainly a top priority concern for NATO uh, in an already destabilized global security environment, but I'm not sure that from a legal point of view, hypersonic missiles pose deep or unprecedented challenges that we couldn't handle. And then there's fancier technology bordering sci-fi, and that is perhaps nanotechnology. But then I know nothing about nanotechnology yet. It's shrouded in secrecy. But what we do know is that the military is certainly after it. And if we just think of how we're concerned about microplastic particles being in our environment and in, on the high seas, if this goes to weaponized material at the nano scale, then certainly we have a far-reaching environmental uh, and health issue probably there. Um, there's other things like human enhancement, and depending on what you mean by human enhancement, whether you're just thinking of an exoskeleton or whether you think of genetic engineering, this can be deeply troubling and raise profound ethical and legal issues. But the two technologies that are, in a way, already up on us and that combined together will lead us to an automated battlefield, I think that's where things are going, is artificial intelligence on the one hand and cyber capacities on the other. And these are the two domains and the two technologies that I want to discuss and focus on uh, with you today. Why cyber? Because as the world is increasingly cyberized, the attack surfaces increase exponentially. The Internet of Things, the baby phones, uh, the fridges, but also smart cities, smart traffic, smart industries, all these are attack surfaces in a cyber paradigm. And at the same time, what we're also seeing, and I think the coronavirus is illustrating it quite well, in a globalized world where our economies are so deeply interconnected, we have created interdependencies uh, that can be uh, weaponized, that create new vulnerabilities. And I mean, someone ate a pangolin in China, and that wasn't a good idea, and now supply chains are breaking down on a global scale. Just imagine what could be done if someone disrupted a nation's economy with cyber means and the effects that would have on a probably global uh, scale. That's why cyber is, I think, an important issue for us. And artificial intelligence is perhaps more difficult to handle because we're not so sure where we currently stand in that development. And I'm not sure we've all understood what artificial intelligence will really bring about, me included. Um, but I think we know some things. We're, we've, we're currently addressing the tip of the iceberg, if you want, and that's lethal autonomous weapon systems. That is where artificial intelligence meets robotics. And creates killer robots, and that's a useful label to really kind of bring down the debate to a certain issue. But it's just a category of weapon systems. And I think the broader issue with artificial intelligence is that gradually and increasingly and possibly rapidly, it'll influence all military decision making. It won't just feature in certain weapon systems, but there will be predictive risk assessments. This will help in tactical decisions and operational decisions, whom to attack, whom to detain, how to control and occupy territory, population control, facial recognition. This, I think, is why artificial intelligence should worry us, or concern us at least, uh, and why there should be more debate about general applications of AI away from the rather narrow focus just on lethal autonomous weapon systems, where I think we've pretty much solved all the issues, and we're now onto a policy debate to see whether we can move that uh, any, any forward. Just in terms of AI and the automated battlefield and, and where we currently stand, I'm not going to engage in, in speculation, uh, but we reach superhuman capacity in the game of poker and in the strategic board game of Go a few years ago. And these are considered significant milestones uh, for the capacities that have been achieved with artificial intelligence at this stage. It's not long ago that the prediction had it that this could only happen well into the 22nd century. And it happened in 2015 and 2017. And I'll give you just one more example to set the scene, and then we'll turn to the law, really. Um, there has already been an operation where a range of sensors were dropped into the jungle, airdropped from a plane into the jungle, seismic sensors, acoustic sensors, olfactory sensors out of all, to really map all human activity in the jungle. Now, the thing, so to really get a, a very precise kind of real-time mapping of what is happening, that's the kind of sensor scenario I think that we 
have to think of, automated battlefields. What happens if you do that in cities? Uh, if you combine it with cell phone surveillance and so on, you can create pretty exact mapping of what everyone in a city or country is doing. The thing with the operation I've just described is that this was uh, Operation Igloo White, and it happened in 1968, uh, and it was all across the Ho Chi Minh Trail in the Vietnam War. And my point is, if we already plastered the jungle with sensors in 1968, that can give us at least an idea of what we might be capable of doing today and in the coming, coming years. <clears throat> now, to IHL, uh, let me just make a few general remarks about IHL before we really go technology specific. The first remark is that uh, we should just keep in mind that currently the major humanitarian problems that we're facing certainly don't result from new military technologies. It's not high-end technology, it's crude technology. It's barrel bombs, it's IEDs, improvised explosive devices. It is kind of medieval strategies like siege warfare, starvation tactics that we're seeing in Syria, in Yemen, and other places. This, I think, is the major humanitarian concern of uh, the moment. And there are some glaring gaps also still in, in the legal order. And so focusing on all these new technologies doesn't mean that we don't have other problems. To my mind, personally, and this just as a side note, really, the most glaring omission in, in, in the legal framework is the absence of a prohibition of civil wars. We're not even we're discussing fancy artificial intelligence, and we're not, not, at least not in academic circles. I can see why it's a difficult discussion, but not even in academic circles. At a time where we realize that we're facing forever wars, that once they start, we cannot stop, no one's discussing a prohibition of civil wars. That's, that's odd to me. We're taking, international law is taking a neutral stance on civil wars in the same way that it's neutral to espionage. I think that value judgment can't be right. But leaving this aside, I think when talking about high-tech future wars, let's not lose sight of the low-tech wars, and let's be careful that we don't create kind of a diverse dichotomy in, in, in the legal order, like a legal regime for high-tech wars and another one for low-tech wars. There, I think we have to make a mental note when engaging in new tech discussions, how do we keep it all together? Because I think AI and cyber, they raise new and different protection needs, uh, and so we have just to be cautious that we're not losing sight of the international legal regime as a whole. As we're moving forward, thinking about new rules, and maybe IHL really needs a revision in this regard with cyber and AI, we um, should also probably keep in mind that we have already reached a complexity in the laws of war that's pretty staggering, really. I sometimes say, I mean, we have, we have over a thousand rules in treaty law, well over a thousand rules. We have an inflation of manuals trying to make sense of all of this, but then there's so many of them, it's hard to <laughs> not lose sight <laughs> of, of the overall picture. Uh, the Department of Defense in the United States, as you will know, has a 1,000, over 1,000 pages law of war manual. The original idea was that this legal regime is, in a way, simple, uh, so that it is realistic to be applied under battlefield conditions. A 1,000 pages explanation is not simple. And increasingly, it reminds me of like German taxation law. And, and that's really not a trajectory where the laws of war should be going. And I think we need to keep this in mind as we're talking about reform and maybe adding new layers of protection, legal protection to the existing regime. That should not slip from our minds. Also, since we will reflect on these new protection needs and what that might mean, how that translates into law, um, let's just, I mean, let's keep in mind what, what we have already. And let's remind ourselves of the spirit of humanitarian law. The, the real spirit and the original kind of rationale is to put the brakes on our worst impulses. It's meant to provide baseline protection, rudimentary legal protection, not super sophisticated protection of each and everything that might occur in, in wartime. That'll be a challenge. And I think in, in all the discussions regarding IHL and new technologies, the main issue underlying all the technical legal discussions is, where do we draw the lines in the 21st century? What are the protection needs of our time that need to be captured by IHL? Not each and every inconvenience will need to come onto the radar of IHL, but some things I think have changed. With cyber means you can attack society in a way that you could not in the 20th century. You can disrupt processes in the economy, in the financial sector, uh, in everyday administrative kind of business, regulating public life. All of this can be pretty profoundly, destructively disrupted. 
Is that just an inconvenience, as we probably would have looked at it in the 20th century, or are we prepared to say, no, this is 21st century. This is essential for how we do things, how we run public life, how we maintain the global economy. This is something that now needs to be brought onto the radar of humanitarian law. It's a difficult discussion, and it's first and foremost a policy discussion, and not so much a legal discussion. And that is also why some of the legal debates are stagnating. And you can see it very vividly in cyberspace, I think. In cyberspace, um, in a way, we started out with the Tallinn Manual, and I was part of it, and I think it was a really good idea at the time. But the Tallinn Manual, of course, was a, was a holistic mapping of the entire humanitarian legal order and how it would work out in cyberspace. And we went through the exercise at the time, but the exercise really was to show and create some stability around a new issue also. States were very concerned at the time, were longing for stability and legal certainty. And the idea was also very much to show that the legal order works. No legal vacuum in cyberspace. You have heard the slogan, I guess. And so as part of the exercise, the focus was not so much on the problematic areas. The focus was very much on, on the areas that do work. And it was very much from day one, it was on the law. And we didn't really consider the various policy issues. And what it, the debate didn't start with what are the protection needs in cyberspace and how should we address them. The debate was, here is IHL from 1949. How does it work in cyberspace? And the issues we're grappling with today is that, in a way, we've advanced in the legal debate but we would like to turn back the clock and come back to these basic questions. What do we do about data protection in war? You know, right now, in, if, if you know about cyber debates, there is an ongoing discussion whether data can be an object or not. Is that within the realm of the wording? Systematic interpretation, very technical and fine-grained. But we're not really concerned whether data can be an object or not. The question we're really concerned with is, how do we protect data in warfare in the 21st century? And it's very difficult, once you're engaged already full speed in these legal sophisticated discussions, to turn back the clock and come back to square one and figure out what it actually is that we want to achieve in cyberspace. So that, in, a, in a way, that's the tenet of my talk today as we go deeper now. Um, but what do we mean by baseline protection, rudimentary protection, in the way that humanitarian law should, should guarantee it? What do we mean by this in the 21st century? That's the main point. OK, before we go there, a, a brief excursion into the realm of use ad bellum, <clears throat> just because that's where most of the action is currently happening. And it's quite telling also for our discussions uh, in the realm of humanitarian law. So use ad bellum, I think we're seeing two features that are of particular concern here. Cyberspace in particular, and I'll start with cyber and come to artificial intelligence later. So with cyber, cyberspace has opened up new opportunities for states to punch above their weight, and it has enabled new disruptive power projections. All of them so far have remained well, usually well remained be the threshold below the threshold of armed conflict. They've remained below the threshold of an armed attack or a use of force. They're somewhere below, but they're corrosive, manipulative, and can be very disruptive. And so whereas in the 20th century, under the use ad bellum paradigm, we were very much concerned with coercive activity and uses of force, I think in the 21st century, we still have that problem, but we've added the layer of corrosive manipulative activity. And this is where easily these kind of operations fall through the cracks, and you can call that hybrid war, uh, you could call it an era of unfriendly relations where states seem to be much more prepared to intrude deeply into another state's affair. And we're very busy trying to draw the line here. Um, and there's an attribution issue, but I won't go into attribution. I think that's, in a way, overrated, that issue. And we're seeing a normalization of attribution issues in cyberspace. I don't think it's as big as a problem as it's sometimes uh, depicted. But I do think the bigger issue right now and the bigger legal discussion certainly is, where does international law draw the line in terms of all these disruptive activities hacking into another state's electricity grid? allowed or prohibited, meddling with elections. You know, these disruptive activities, they can happen in the social sphere, if you want, public opinion formation, manipulation. They can happen on the technical level, just hacking in penetrating systems, stealing information, small acts of sabotage, bigger acts of sabotage, power outages, and so on and so on. I mean, it's a broad, broad spectrum. And as an international lawyer, you get constantly asked, where does international law draw the line? What's allowed? and what is below the radar of international law. 
And there is, if, if you ask two lawyers, international lawyers, they'll give you two and a half answers at least. And none of them is false, because there is so much scope for interpretation in these rather general uh, principles, usually. And again, this is a policy issue. This is more for states to figure out where do you want to draw the line? What do you where do you think sovereignty, the principle of non-intervention, the use of force, where do they draw the line? And the thing is, states have been very reluctant to come forward with any kind of positioning for understandable reasons. This is a new era, uh, a new field of technology, power reshuffling, so you don't want to tie your hands to any legal position prematurely. I can understand this. Now they increasingly are coming forward because I think they've realized, no, we need more stability here. In order to, to end the Wild West kind of climate in cyberspace, we need to start drawing these lines. And they're doing this, and very helpfully so. But even among European and NATO partners, there is a considerable disagreement as to where these lines should be drawn. As you might know, for example, the UK, in its public positioning, thought that sovereignty is not actually a rule under international law, and therefore does not draw any protective lines here. It only starts with the non-intervention principle, according to the United Kingdom. France and the Netherlands took a different position. They said, no, 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 there's non-intervention, there's use of force prohibitions, but there's also the sovereignty barrier as a standing and binding rule of international uh, law. So we have all of this. And in these debates, and I think this is important in the latest kind of pronouncements from France and from the Netherlands, increasingly we're seeing a willingness to include manipulations, severe manipulations in the economic domain with financial markets into notions such as the use of force um, or even an armed attack. And that's something that's relatively new. As you will know, the 20th century mindset on these issues and interpretations were very much focused on physical destruction. And below that threshold, it didn't really qualify as a use of force or an armed attack. Now, moving towards non-destructive operations that can be very disruptive, nevertheless. This is what France and the Netherlands, not in its positioning, but in public statements, have done. That's, I think, the right way to go forward. Uh, it can't be any other way in the 21st century. And I think this already is something where we need to make a mental note. It's important for our debates also in use in Bello, uh, because taking these processes into account, away from physical destruction, death, injury, injury, like what we saw in the second word for this paradigm with which, I mean, the humanitarian legal order is really imbued still. Moving on from this to also protect these kind of processes will be important. And there, I think the use ad bellum debate is showing the way forward. One more remark on, on, on the use ad bellum level, apart from disruptive power projections that are somewhere between peace and war, we're also seeing the cyber arms race. And I just wanted to point out that the cyber arms race is different from traditional arms races in many ways, and for various reasons also falls through the cracks of an, in any way, eroding global disarmament and global arms control order. The point about cyberspace is that it's not only about amassing certain military objects or know-how, uh, allocating resources, that's part of the arms race. But a big part of the cyber arms race is also penetrating your enemy's system systems well in advance of any future armed conflict. Without knowing your enemy system, you're not going to stand a chance in cyberspace. And not only will you want to know your enemy systems, you might want to implant a backdoor here and there so that you can ensure you'll have access should conflict break out in the future. You might want to go even further and sabotage some of the actions. So we're not really seeing an arms race, we're seeing a hacking race, uh, uh, a surveillance race, and maybe a race of sabotage. And that's a big part of the cyber arms race. Now the problem is that all of this would seem to be in violation of principles like sovereignty and maybe even non-intervention. And yet, pretty much every state is my, I have no proof for this, I can only guess, but I would guess, and having been in the field in cyber discussions for a long time, uh, I think I can make an informed guess that pretty much every state that wants to have a say in cyberspace is engaged in this kind of activity. And I'll just give you one example from an unlikely kind of candidate, Germany, not known among its NATO allies for very proactive stances in military affairs, usually. But uh, the German military forces brought out a paper in 2018, uh, how are the German armed forces fighting in, in future wars? And it explicitly said that they believe it's necessary to penetrate your enemy system well below the threshold uh, of an armed conflict. 
Now, if Germany, is, it's a controversial study in Germany, I don't think the Ministry of Defense really liked it, but it's, it's the armed forces of Germany speaking, it's their thinking. I think it's the right way. I think there is no real alternative to, to this. But if Germany comes out in a way publicly saying that this is something that they need to consider to be, I mean, up there in cyberspace, then you can have a guess what some other states, how they might uh, look at the issue. OK, so much uh, on the use at Bellum. And now I'll read uh, what my job description at the Geneva Academy really entails and uh, would like uh, to focus on the use in Bellum uh, level. I always start out, and I speak about this top topic quite often, I always start out by saying that we have not yet seen cyber warfare in the real sense. The word is endemic and making headlines every day, I know, but I don't think that we have seen cyber warfare in the sense that there is capable military actors trying to degrade mutually their information environment. I'm aware that we've seen some cyber operations in the context of armed conflict in Georgia, in Ukraine, against Islamic State, yes. But I still think, and just looking at what the defense budgets are, what, what kind of money is invested in these capacities, thinking of the sophistication that we've seen in Stuxnet at the time, in 2010, um, and many other examples, uh, also considering that, that we already know that intelligence services have, have access to anything in, in cyberspace. I mean, the, the, the major and most important data exchange nodes is in Frankfurt, and we know that different intelligence services have penetrated it, and this is where they're gathering most of the information, because this is where European communications go through. If we have all these capabilities in peacetime already, then we can assume that cyber warfare in the real sense where hostilities move onto cyber, the cyber plane, uh, could be quite disruptive and very significant and could be more significant than just ha hacking teddy bears and baby phones and so on. That's part of these issues that are often discussed, like baby phones, they're not well protected, it's easy to create a botnet and so on. I think that's part of the discussion for general cyber security in peacetime. But I think we should just keep in mind that in wartime, things might still look different. And I think capacities, military capacities, have quite advanced in this field. Now, as an academic, of course, I'm concerned with those areas of the law that don't work very well. And before I go there, uh, and so as not to give the impression that I want to erode IHL, let me just say there are, of course, many IHL rules that already exist and that work quite well and that draw important red lines also in cyberspace. The prohibition to directly attack civilians, the prohibition to directly attack civilian objects, the prohibition on terror terrorizing the civilian population or starvation, all this is relevant to cyberspace and adds important protective layers. But that's all I'm going to say on the, way, uh, on the things that work well. Uh, and from here on onwards, I would like to focus on some issues where uh, new protection needs may have arisen that we still need to address or where old principles don't really deliver maybe uh, protection in the sense that we would hope they do. Let's start with the principle of distinction. As you know, in the use in Bello, that's a fundamental principle on which many of the specific rules are premised and born out of, in a sense. The principle of distinction, of course, if you think of cyberspace as the most inter- and hyper-connected space, where things move at rapid speed, Distinguishing any things on the basic of physical object distinction, if we were to sit in this room and if no rules existed and someone asked us to come up with a new principle to, to offer protection in cyberspace, would we come up with a principle that distinguishes on the basis of objects? And would we then distinguish between civilian and military objects? I'm not so sure for cyberspace. I think in cyberspace, what we're more concerned with is the functionalities that can be manipulated, that software processes deliver to us. And I mean, there's also objects because cyberspace, in a way, has both the virtual layer and the physical layer. There is cables and computers and servers. And yes, that's where distinction can still work. But the beauty of cyberspace is, of course, all the services and functionalities that it delivers and, and on which we are increasingly relying. In those services there, I'm not so sure whether distinction can really deliver an adequate level uh, of protection still. Think of just of a house, maybe. And in the 20th century, the approach was, well, we'll come up with a prohibition to bomb the house. And by imposing that prohibition, focusing on the house, we'll also make sure that there'll be shelter and protection from the elements and all the rest of it. But nowadays, you can 
do away with shelter and protection from the elements by virtually locking the door without destroying the house. That's what I mean with the functionalities that are inherent in these objects. That's, I think, where more focus uh, needs to be on in the cyber realm, and that, in a way, could fall through the cracks of the principle of distinction. The other issue with the distinction principle, so I'm saying distinction partly works, but there are other layers in cyberspace where distinction is really difficult. That's my first point. And another example of why distinction could be difficult to apply and to deliver protection on an adequate level <clears throat> is the dual news use nature of cyberspace as a whole. Now, 90% of, of the global cyber infrastructure is civilian owned, not military in any sense, and in any future armed conflict, if there's significant kind of military use of cyberspace, of course, all of this infrastructure will be used in one way or another for military purposes. Now, we could, and if you know the definition regarding dual use and when a civilian object is turned into a military object, if you use a civilian object in a militarily conducive way to make an effective contribution to military operations, it'll lose protection and it can be attacked. Um, and, so, and that's true for pretty much every object. Every object is, in a sense, dual use. If, if you find a military use for the chair over there, it would be turned into a military object. Now, for the chair, it's unlikely, but for the global cyber infrastructure, it's a given that it will be used in one way or another for military purposes. Now, I'm not saying that renders the entire military, uh, the entire global cyber infrastructure automatically a military objective, even though Tallinn Manual 1 said that, in theory, this is possible, and that is a statement that should concern all of us. But I think the definition that we currently have, like use of an object can turn it into a military objective, even intended future use of an object, it, the object not yet being used for military purposes, just intended future use can turn it into a legitimate military target. And if we have interpreters that are not so benevolent, maybe, and I think looking around in this current state of the world, there might be some actors <laughs> whom we don't want to trust uh, on, on this, um, this becomes a real issue. I, what I'm saying really is that we have so much leeway in the, in the existing law. Easily, if you wanted to make the argument that vast parts of the global cyber infrastructure have been turned into a military object, you could probably make that argument. You can also make the counter argument. You could, for example, say, and very plausibly, well, just using cyber infrastructure for military communications is not really yet the kind of use that qualifies the infrastructure as a military objective. I certainly agree with this, but I'm, you could also make the counter argument. And under the law as it currently stands, and without further clarification, it's far from clear which of those views should prevail or would prevail in the future. If you take into consideration that China and the United States have publicly said that they consider cyberspace a domain of warfare, and that in times of war they would try to achieve global cyber dominance. Now, if I'm after global cyber dominance in times of war, then a wide interpretation of the dual use structure as a military objective might be quite conducive <laughs> to, to this objective. So all I'm saying here is that there is still some ambiguity and uncertainty, and I think it should concern us, um, and clarification in the realm of the principle of distinction is urgently needed in cyberspace. But I think that would just be, I mean, clarification on the basis of existing law. Now I would like to go into two other fields where I think we might could benefit from reform and might need to take international humanitarian law to the next level, 21st century level, so to say. The first point I would like to make in this sense is that we need to think about how we protect societies. In the 21st century, the function, how do we sustain and maintain the functioning of societies? How do we protect our economies, financial sectors, banking sector? How do we protect the administration of Geneva in times of warfare? Um, and the reason I'm saying this and laying this out and calling it society protection is that in the past, in the 20th century, our legal protections were very much focused on destructive warfare. And I think very much with Second World War in mind, physical destruction, death, and injury. And given the nature of IHL that it's just providing baseline protection, pretty much everything else below the threshold of death, injury, and physical damage was considered a side effect, inevitable side effect of war something that just accompanies war and there's not something we can do about it and not something we want to, at least not on a, on a legal uh, level. Otherwise, it wouldn't be baseline protection. But now in the 21st century, it's no longer only about destructive warfare. You can wage cyber operation that can profoundly disrupt 
the econ economic sector that can take out the entire banking sector uh, of Geneva and easily so. So that under the law as it currently stands, my 20 year old bicycle, a civilian physical object, if you destroy it, that is relevant for international humanitarian law because you have destroyed, physically destroyed a civilian object. If you take out the banking sector of Geneva, that is far from clear and probably that's not currently protected because that's just banking, that's like an inconvenience in war, that's a side effect of, of war fighting. And I don't think in the 21st century that balance is still quite right. Now, the reason why when initially when I started the presentation, I, I said we need to keep in mind what IHL is all about, the handbrakes on our worst impulses. So I can see how to, to a number of military actors, the idea of now extending protection in wartime to these kind of functionalities and societies would go too far would overstretch IHL, would kind of overpromise and then underdeliver in times of war. But I think this is where uh, significantly more discussion uh, is needed. The Tallinn manual uh, kind of tried to, to, to come to some kind of compromise here uh, by saying that, well, if, if we look at the law as it stands, the wording that is commonly used is damage. And we could slowly try to dynamically interpret this, the wording damage to include the loss of functionality. And if we do this, if we extend the understanding of damage to including losses of functionality, then under existing law, we could handle some of these occurrences. But then the majority, at least in the Tallinn discussions, also said that, well, yes, loss of functionality, but keep the handbrakes on only if restoring functionality would require the replacement of physical parts. So what they were kind of trying to do, they saw the problem, but they clinched to 20th century industrial world thinking as much <laughs> as they could by kind of linking loss of functionality back to physical replacement of parts. But that really is not what cyber is about. You can do a lot of damage in cyberspace without any physical components having to been replaced. And I think of it more that we should turn our focus on these functionalities that we want to preserve. That's where the humanitarian issue is and how can we capture these illegally. And this the Tallinn manual, I mean, I was part of it, of course, this is self-criticism and things evolve and this is dynamic thinking in a very dynamic field. But like, like this attempt to, to, to link loss of functionality back to the replacement of physical parts, it, it reminds me of the Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace, uh, which starts out by saying, governments of the industrial world, you very giants of flesh and steel, and then it kind of continues and it ends up by saying, leave us alone, you have no clue what's happening in cyberspace. And I'm sometimes reminded uh, of this. I don't think we can tie it back to, to, to physical uh, occurrences. I think we need to move on, evolve the law to capture these functionalities. The proposition that I have in this regard, and I'm under no illusion that this could happen anytime soon, but I think what, we're, what we should be discussing, at least, is maybe adding a new rule that protects indispensable and essential services and functionalities for society. You may know we have already, we currently have a regulation from the 20th century protecting indispensable foodstuffs, objects indispensable for the survival of the civilian population. That's still very civilian population, human focused. And I think in cyberspace, we should evolve and add another layer of protection here by saying services and functionalities that are fundamentally essential, indispensable for the functioning of societies need to be protected. The threshold would, ha would have to be very high not just any disturbance in cyberspace in, in the administration, no, not at that level, but taking out the administration of an, an entire city, encrypting everything that's happening uh, in the canton of uh, Geneva, yeah, maybe at that level we could draw a new line of baseline protection for the 21st century. That's my first proposal. I, as I said, I, it's not realistic to think that we're going to have that discussion on a policy level anytime soon, but I was delighted to see the French positioning, um, which is kind of in between what I've just suggested, a new rule, uh, or the very narrow kind of focused reinterpretation of the Tallinn manual. France has now come out by saying that, well, in different notions of IHL, the attack notion in particular, we need to include this loss of functionality, irrespective whether it's temporary, whether there's physical or other repair required, loss of functionality is in a way what we're after. That is, but it's only one state. And I'm certainly hoping that Switzerland, Germany, other states, many states are now working on these kind of positioning papers. We have realized we're not going to achieve a new cyber convention anytime soon. States have decided to do it step by step. 
help customary law to evolve, and they're all positioning themselves now, and I think if more states go along the French position, then that would be a step uh, in the right uh, direction. And um, I think Germany is, they, they have a position in the making. I'm certainly hopeful that they will um, jump onto what uh, France has done. A second kind of, it's too early for a proposal here, but a second layer or issue area where I think we need to refocus our cyber discussions. Protecting the global information environment. That would be my label for where we should have a range of kind of different discussions from now on. Protecting the global information space would entail, first of all, the question of data protection that I've already mentioned. I think Tully Manuel came out by saying that data does not currently qualify as an object, and if it's not an object, the conduct of hostilities rules don't apply to data, and then data is fair game. Now go and tell that to the 10 most highly valued companies in the world, go and tell it to Apple and Facebook. I think sometimes it really depends where you're having these discussions. And if in the 21st century you were discussing with a wider audience outside military and other circles, and if you were discussing the question of data protection, everyone would probably say, well, some kind of very basic rudimentary data protection must also continue in times of war. Again, we can't over, over promise on this, but something, nothing at all, can that be, is that tenable in the 21st century where increasingly our economies, everything we do is relying on data and we're producing ever more? I don't think so. Um, so that needs one discussion. There's a lot of issues there. I mean, if, if the, by the time, and we're, we'll soon be there when cyber and artificial intelligence, as they increasingly merge, will have ever more data that is being processed, highly sensitive data included, unprotected in times of war? I don't think so. I don't have the answer where we would draw the line, and this will be very difficult. And I understand that in times of war, the military will have to be able to, to manipulate and tamper with data. But maybe there's some excesses that we don't want to see. Um, deletion of, of important content data. Should it be allowed to delete all taxpayers' data in, in Switzerland? Or to leak it all? That's another issue apart from data. I mean, fake news operations, incitement of hate speech and all this, things we're struggling with in, in, in the peace domain already, uh, but that are highly relevant, of course, also in, in an armed conflict uh, setting. I th we're not even discussing them. So I think the debate has stopped with the Tallinn Manual, and the Tallinn Manual was looking at the, the kind of traditional rules about perfidy and ruses of war. Now, perfidy means that if I wave a white flag as a soldier, but then draw a gun, I'm committing the war crime of perfidy. That's something that's prohibited, because I'm eroding trust in, in humanitarian law. That's the reason why we're criminalizing it as a war crime. But if I, if, if I leak all bank data in Switzerland, that's OK, probably, under the law as it currently stands. I'm not saying it is OK, but I'm saying that we have no legal discussion, no legal guidance, really, in this area. Does human rights law continue to apply? In wartime, certainly it does, but does it help us if states are the actors fighting each other? I'm not so sure that we can glean much from human rights law in this debate. I mean, with fake news and all the rest, as we're discussing it in peacetime, the big discussion is how do we control content? And are we not infringing on some actors' freedom of expression and other important human rights? And an important debate, but it's quite a different issue in wartime when, as a matter of military operations, states might have the idea to manipulate, degrade in information, delete information, de encrypt data. I mean, there's a long spectrum of things that are possible. So starting to think about how we want to protect the global information space in times of war in the 21st century, I think, is a debate that we should be having. I'm not seeing it at all. Um, so that's just for the way forward. And also another feature of humanitarian law that, that deserves more attention in all of this is, I think, the law of neutrality. Because, you know, in a, in a globalized, interdependent world, tampering with big amounts of data in one state probably implicates the interests of many other states, could have economic effects across the globe. Does neutrality have any say in this? We're not seeing any, I mean, neutrality, the last we heard is 1907, the Hague Convention. I know it's a bit dated, but I think neutrality is something in an, I mean, globalized, cyberized, totally interdependent world. <laughs> neutrality is something that might need to be revisited sooner rather than later. 
Now with this, let me uh, continue and move on to artificial intelligence and leave the cyber debate behind. I think we have enough uh, ideas out there for, for discussion and controversial discussion. Artificial intelligence and the tip of the iceberg, lethal autonomous weapons systems. In that regard, I'll keep it relatively short because I think by now we've gathered useful knowledge. We know what the questions really are. We know where the issues are. What we're trying to do really at the end of the day uh, with, uh, with lethal autonomous weapon systems is to address specific issues. Um, and, and the most important issue is that we want to translate ethical concerns into binding international law. And the most important ethical concern that has emerged is that with autonomous weapon systems, we want to maintain meaningful human control. And the good news is that in the CCW, where this issue has been discussed over since 2014, and unfortunately discussions still continue, um, so the process is in a way moving at snail's pace, and many observers would hope that we could move into treaty negotiations sooner and not adding another two years of discussion. Let's see. But what has emerged, and there is virtually agreement among the 80 states in the UNCCW, that some kind of human control should be maintained. And we're not talking about human control in all AI-driven features in military operations. The focus is very much on just the critical functions. It's clear by now that it's pretty unproblematic if, if certain military platforms can operate autonomously, if they can navigate, fly, and land, and all of this. That's not our issue. The issue is autonomy in critical functions, target selection, target engagement. That's where we want to maintain human control in the critical functions of certain uh, weapon systems. And at the current juncture, and we have relative agreement around this issue, in the same sense that we have agreement that IHL applies in cyberspace, but then <laughs> we're entering a gray zone. And the gray zone with AI and lethal autonomous weapon systems is that states can't really agree on what they mean by meaningful human control. Um, with pretty sophisticated knowledge about what it could mean by now, I'll just put it out quite simply. I mean, to some observers, human control in an artificial intelligence-driven system would mean, in a way, a kill switch. You can deactivate the system. That would be kind of the most visible form of constant, continuous human control over what the system is doing. You could turn it off at any moment in time when you think this is going awry. And others think, no, human control does not need to be a kill switch. That would defy the whole strategic idea of having autonomous weapon systems. The beauty of an autonomous weapon system from a strategic perspective is that it can operate at machine speed and outpace human speed by many times. That's the strategic kind of promise of, of moving uh, on to AI-driven systems. So by inserting this human-operated kill switch and a human being being able to monitor everything the system is doing, we're tying the whole system back to human speed. That's not the idea if you're going after machine speed. And of course, the problem in all of this, and the reason why we're not going to see any ban on these systems anytime so soon, is that, as Putin has said, whoever reaches machine speed first in AI is going to be the leader of the world. And this is why big AI players, of course, are engaged in this AI arms race and want to go faster and be first in this uh, endeavor. That's the kind of issue. Um, so we've generated excellent knowledge. NGOs, uh, ICRC included, have, have all helped to, to kind of get a better sense of what human control could mean, supervision, deactivation, standards for predictability and reliability of these systems, all of this. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> if you combine all of this, it wants to tie the system back to the human speed level. Uh, and that's going to be the policy issue around which this debate will continue. And we can have another two years of expert discussions about what human control could mean and might mean. At the end of the day, it comes back to this problem, machine speed or human speed. And I think speed in warfare operations is another big and challenging issue that deserves further discussion. And without discussion on this issue and where we, um, as a collective, would want to draw the line on, on speed in warfare operations, without that discussion, it'll be hard to make any advances in the laws, the lethal autonomous weapons systems discussion. But below the iceberg, and I'll, it's my final 
issue area and topic for today. Below the tip of the iceberg, the lethal autonomous weapon systems where robotics and AI are merged into these systems that can operate autonomously. Below the tip of the iceberg is this issue of AI-driven decision-making in military operations generally. And as I've said before, this could have various features. AI is an enabling technology. Um, as the technology unfolds, I mean, 20 years ago, no one had a smartphone. Today, everyone has. And the same will happen with AI-driven features in all aspects of general life decision-making, but also military decision-making. And I think here we need to start a discussion, and we're already having it in some sectors, predictive policing and so on, but we need to start the same discussion now with military decision making. Is AI just helping human beings to find the right decisions because it can pull together all the data, all the haystacks that we have created? Or is AI augmenting human decision making or even replacing human decision making? And what are the problems if we start to rely increasingly on AI made and supported decisions? Um, a problem can be that AI can have inherent biases um, that you might not be able to see. How powerful and useful uh, artificial intelligence operates very much depends on the input data. If the input data is poor or not controlled and not monitored, then you will have the output will be biased decisions. Artificial intelligence, if it's really powerful, artificial intelligence is also in a way unpredictable. It may create new biases of its own. So it needs to be monitored and controlled. Otherwise, it could discriminate in a way that we as human beings might not even be able to anticipate. There's also something called like to do with complacency. Uh, and the reason that if you have AI-driven decision making, human beings tend to want to rely on that without maybe being able to question the process, maybe it's intransparent, and all the problems that are tied to that issue. There's issues of accountability and uh, moral diffusion uh, in AI-driven decision-making. There's a range of different issues. There's also the issue that AI reaches decisions on correlation and not on the basis of causation. AI can help you to make group-level decisions, but not so much individualized decisions. Uh, so for detention, for example, if all the sensors dropped on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they tell you, well, Robin, guys, he was seen on that trail every second day a week. AI might come out with, well, Robin, guys, must be a security risk and will suggest to detain me. Um, that's how it could work. And someone would maybe need to question these kind of decisions uh, before uh, just relying uh, on AI. And I think there's... We're just, I mean, this is really the debate in, it is in its infancy. We're just starting to understand these problems. Um, and I think that debate needs to start in humanitarian law sooner rather than later. It won't be so easy because it won't have that label of the killer robot. The killer robot was easy to gather momentum. Uh, it's in a way appalling to everyone. Uh, it's, 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 uh, I mean, it, you can gather momentum around this topic. Now the topic, which is I think maybe even a bigger topic, but it's so much more diffuse and it will be more difficult to get the discussion going around this issue. But at the end of the day, the discussion really is how do we maintain, do we want a machine-centric uh, kind of uh, humanitarian law for the 21st century and how do we make sure it remains human-centric if we agree that it should remain human-centric. That's, I think, the challenge uh, before us. Um, one more point and just really like, like the long view on all of these issues uh, and then I'll end and I look forward to our discussion. The long view, of course, is that if it is really true, if artificial intelligence and weapon systems and more generally in decision making, if it has superhuman performance capability, if it can be more accurate, never tires, is not bored by routine, uh, but reaches the right and good decisions, if that promise really holds true, I'm not sure it does, but if it did, then of course, if there is superhuman capability, then I'm not sure that we should only tie all these systems to the law as it currently stands. The law as it currently stands, the human being was always factored into the law. Humans in times of warfare, they, they, they face risks to life and, and, and bodily integrity and so on. Uh, they might be fearful, angry and so on. I think that was factored in. Human empathy and other factors have been factored into the law. 
And I'm not sure that this legal regime and the pretty rudimentary baseline standards that we have in humanitarian law, is that the right regime to be applied to systems that have superhuman capacity and face no risk to life when operating? I think what I'm saying is we could program them much more conservatively and not just possibly as a matter of policy, we should need to reflect maybe whether we should not bind them to much stricter legal standards if it is really true that there's superhuman capacity and if we believe all the promise about artificial intelligence driven military systems, then I don't think that the very basic principle of distinction and allowing the use of lethal force on a primitive principle like basic distinction between a civilian and military, that might be the right principle for a soldier who cannot differentiate so, so quickly in, in, in a, under war battle conditions, but for a machine-driven, AI-driven system, I think we could work with other legal standards. That's almost bordering heresy in uh, military circles, <laughs> at least, I think. And I'm not suggesting this for any time soon, uh, but if things are as accelerated as they appear to be going in the direction of AI-driven military technologies, I think we should not lose sight of possibly stricter legal th standards. Thank you very much.